I'm James Barron. I'd like to welcome everyone to our Zoom conversation with uh, Jeanette Montgomery Barron and Nick Rourke. Uh, Nick is the publisher of the new book, Cindy Sherman Contact. Jeanette, of course, is the photographer. Um, before we begin, a, a few thank yous to my staff, Casey Cross, our gallery director, uh, Maria Klamis, and to um, Dylan Everett for their efforts to make this possible. So um, this is sort of an incredible occasion. Uh, welcome both of you. Hello. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> Nick, hi. Great things from London. How are you? So uh, it's, yeah, it's great to have you from London. We're looking at the cover of this really stupendous book. Um, congratulations to both of you. And today in 40 minutes, I'd like to explore a little bit how it came about, how this book came about, um, which is sort of a unique story. Um, Maria, could we have the next slide, please? So um, as a little preface, there was an exhibition at Collezioni Marmotti, which is in Reggio Emilia, outside of Bologna, um, a number of years ago. Um, it's actually kind of a funny story, Janet, how the, it came about. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, what you should tell the story. Well, cause... I was actually offering an artwork to this museum, which is a collection of Italian art. And um, they, I realized they weren't going to take that work. So then I started sending Jeanette's uh, portraits of the 1980s. Jeanette has this encyclopedic um, group of portraits, which are so unique. And I kept getting no response. And my gallery assistant in Rome at the time said, do you realize you're getting no responses? I said, yeah, but they don't know it. They're doing this show. <laughs> so what we didn't know is that they would do it. And not only that, this miraculous show, but then they, at the opening, now this you probably do remember. Uh, up yeah. first. So anyway, it was a, a 40 photographs um, and large scale um, prints all, all throughout the gallery. And at the opening, um, uh, the owners came up to me, one of the owners of uh, Max Mara, and said, you know, I didn't, I'm going to buy this whole show. I said, that's great. Thank no, <laughs> they said, would it be OK if you buy the entire show? And I said, I think we can do that. <laughs> um, so it was sort of amazing. Um, so then they published a, a small book, which was sort of the memorabilia. There had been two books before, Bruno Bischofberger, the epic dealer from Zurich. Now he started uh, collecting your work. Yeah, he started collecting my work. He came to my studio in New York in um, 1984, I think it was. And um, he bought a lot of photographs. And he said, I'm going to do a book. And I said, great, let's do it. And we did it a few years later. I kept photographing more artists and he kept collecting and then we produced that book. Right. But, and then uh, to jump forward, there was a book called Scene, which was also a book largely of your portraits in the 1980s. With text. Right. So I, I actually, for the first time, or the second time, I wrote um, about my photographs too and what it was like photographing these people and memories of the days. So um, that was really fun. So that was just an added element, retrieving my memories of, of those, those sittings. Right. So then Colzino and Maramonti, they did a very beautiful small book, which included a lot of the memorabilia. So this sort of sets the stage. Maria, could we have the next? Uh, this is another um, where you actually can see uh, Starn Twins on the left, Jenny Holzer, and then Cindy Sherman. Now, what's really interesting is, and this is setting the stage for Nick, is that you would, okay, you're very selective, you're a minimalist. Yes. And you would pick generally one, possibly two images. You mean out of the context sheets. Out of the context yeah. sheets. Right. So what we're looking at in this slide, uh, right in the middle is a portrait of Cindy Sherman, which is the image was, which was known basically to the world right. up until very recently. Uh, Maria, the next. Now, Patrick Parrish Gallery. Thank you, Patrick, for this very beautiful show, which opened on March 5th, 2020, 2020 yep. and it closed on March 10th. Well, uh, it actually was open throughout the summer, but we were in lockdown. So. Yeah. Can um, you recount for everybody what the opening was like? Well, March 5th, um, everybody was hugging and kissing, you know. And, no, we weren't and, quite sure. Uh, no, Some people, people were doing were, elbows. Okay. And but there was were a like lot of people there. And then, you know, and the next day, I think the reality set in that things were not going the right way. Right. With the pandemic. 
but it was really um, it's just a stark contrast. So there was a feeling, which I recall, um, is that this was going to be an encyclopedic show. It was the first show of your portraits from the 80s in New York in quite a while. Anyway, yeah. There was, shall we the call largest, it? The largest, the Shall we call it a feeling of disappointment? Well, yes, um, but it's so in the- the next slide, please. This is another um, where you can see Cindy Sherman to the right of that is Jean-Michel Basquiat. There are various other pictures, it's David Sally to the left. Uh, the next, please. Yet another picture, very beautiful installation. And Patrick is fully behind you. Uh, next, please. Beautiful gallery. Another where you've got this row. These are vintage photographs. Yeah. I'm beautifully, beautifully installed. Next, please. So then uh, the date, as I look closely, is April, Wednesday, April 15th. Enter Nick Burke. So Nick, can you remember what it was like when you saw this article? Were you reading the paper? Was it the morning? Were you having a cup of coffee? I do. I, I remember it really clearly. It was um, it was April the 16th and we we just literally gone into lockdown. And it, and, it, and it was funny because I was kind of um, looking into Cindy Sherman's work anyway, um, but I was looking at kind of how other photographers had been observing Cindy. So everyone from uh, kind of Alistair Thane to Warren Nidich and obviously Maplethorpe and Longo. Um, but I came across this Guardian article and it had Basquiat with a trucker's cap on and shades next to Andy Warhol, which looked like he was sat on a fur coat and it was just completely compelling image. and. The more that I kind of read and scrolled down, the more kind of images are revealed uh, that it revealed, and it kind of I, I, I stumbled across the Cindy Sherman image, which I just thought was magnificent. I'd, I'd never kind of experienced or been exposed to Jeanette's work, so this was kind of this this was my entry point to Jeanette's work, and I emailed her straight away. So I emailed her asking about the collection, specifically Cindy. Um, and Jeanette, I mean, you, you replied. Probably 30 seconds later, I think. <laughs> that, that called me. And there had been, I remember this very distinctly, feeling disappointed. You know, yeah, showed yeah, open. Yeah. It was the beginning of the pandemic, but you can actually see in Italy that this was a very, very serious thing. And I remember saying, you know, this is not a short thing. We're looking at a year and a half. I remember saying that right away. So, um, by the way, in this article, there's a picture of um, Bianca Jagger. Can you, Jeanette, give us a couple of recollections? And then also maybe this fabulous picture of Basquiat Warhol. A couple it's of incredible. Before we well, get into yeah, that. Yeah, the, the photo um, of Basquiat Warhol was commissioned by Bruno Bishop for it because he and Tony Schifrazi were doing it. An exhibition of um, their their paintings, their joint paintings, um, and so I went to the factory and I photographed them together, um, and um, and I photographed Basquiat alone and also Warhol alone several times. But um, Bianca Jagger, this was a shoot for German Cosmopolitan, and um, she was wearing Calvin Klein, who was a great friend of hers at the time. But we spent several hours together. And in this photograph, she's she's you can tell she's sort of crying a bit, slightly. Um, she was listening to uh, Neil Young, um, "All Man Look at My Life." Huh. I'm a lot like you, and she wow. just started crying. That's amazing. So when you're taking a picture, you're looking. Obviously, that was like a gift from heaven to have a moment where she's emoting, and she's giving us something very much different from the celebrity. Bianca Jagger, yeah. we all know, right. right? And yet she still has like this incredible, you know, the high cheekbones, gorgeous. this you know, gorgeous. gorgeous now, is it absolutely true that you could set your watch with her if you had a lunch that she no. would show up to the minute on time? No. <laughs> I mean, could you be within two hours? <laughs> so um, there's an aspect of these portraits because the portraits continued for quite a while and then you started with mirrors, which is another aspect I'd like to get into because they're a type of portrait, I mean, yes, invisible they're portrait. self portraits, yeah. right? But um, 
it is sort of an interesting aspect that you, when you're taking these pictures, you're entering into um, you know, the area of your sitter and you're playing by their rules in a sense. Um, do you remember anything with Jean-Michel Basque at well, this moment? I mean, one thing I will say about taking portraits is um, you, it's sort of like falling in love with the person mm -hmm. when you're photographing. Mm -hmm. you, I mean, you're just completely falling in love with them. And, um, and then you, you stop and then you're, you know, you're back to normal. But I think that's really a, a huge part of it for me. We'll get into this a little bit more in a minute when we get to Cindy Sherman, but that's a really interesting observation to me because you pull something from the sitter that another mm -hmm. photographer does not. It's part of your personality that you elicit a type of beauty. Um, there's often a look of um, languor or wistfulness that I see in your mm -hmm. pictures. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about how you think that comes about? I, you know, I wish I could tell you. I, I think I maybe just put people at ease, right? And 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 then I think they're in some kind of inner dialogue, or they're thinking about something that's hopefully calming. Uh, I, mm -hmm. I, I don't know. Okay, that's a really good question. Maria, let's look at the next. Um, and Nick, you know, I want to also hear. I mean, this is obviously Jenny Holzer from '84. Mm -hmm. uh, the next, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Barbara Kruger, interesting two women. Um, I, I think that it, it, it goes back to kind of the immediacy of these images as well. And they're kind of very stripped back and, and still kind of retain a rawness, but just the, the, the lighting and the gaze that's captured is, is, is just wonderful, particularly with you know, the images of Keith or with Basquiat as well. I mean, they're, they're, they're just phenomenal. Um, Keith, you know, we have this memorabilia to the right, um, many of them signed, but yeah. could you talk a little bit about this particular well, setting? This, before we get into the yeah, I mean, and the, and the, the handkerchief is something I received in my mailbox, um, an invitation to a party, um, a folded up handkerchief printed with this invitation, which was fabulous. And I have it hanging, framed and hanging now. Um, uh, I just went to Keith's studio and there are a lot more, I mean, I have a lot of images of, of Keith, but he just went through the motions. I mean, I really did not have to do anything. He was really into this shoot and we had, we had a lot of fun. You know, there's an aspect to this and also to the Cindy Sherman book, which is that it's histor historicized now. Um, unfortunately, not all these artists are still with us. So we see Keith Herring, who since his death has become this enormous icon. I mean, at the time, he was thought by many to be sort of a decorative artist. When you went down there, you yeah. had a shop. Yeah, no, but they, the pop shop was downtown. Right. Um, I think on Lafayette Street. Um, but I mean, yeah, he was, I don't think he, I think he really loved the commercial aspect right. of it too. Now, is it true, I've heard a rumor that you've got a trove of paintings by all these people that you've kept that you're going to release? <laughs> Oh, you yeah. have 10 baskets, <laughs> which are now worth right. a billion dollars. Right. Yeah. And <laughs> I wasn't thinking about that. That was really stupid of me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you paid in all way. I can change that. Well, we all no, that. I did not buy bus. Yeah. All right. Let's look at the next slide, please. Okay. Well, we just talked about this, but yeah. it's nice yeah. that you did get memorabilia from everybody. Yeah. And um, this was know, a nice. restaurant we used to go to for lunch, Jean Lafitte. Jean Lafitte. And um, I, I think I had shown her the, um, I brought the contact sheets with me mm. and she said, please, we touch something. <laughs> <laughs> to the next one, please. I mean, I, you know. She, Leo Castelli, who was a great dealer. I had very recently an interesting experience in Miami where I was with um, a colleague of mine and he had an assistant who was 31 years old. And we were talking about the great dealers of the 80s. We were talking about Leo Castelli and Ileana Sonnabend. And I looked at this, uh, you know, fellow, and he—you could tell there was no recognition. So finally, I said, "May I ask you, do you know who Leo Castelli and Ileana Sonnabend are?" He said, "No, should I?" And I said, "I'd like to try to explain this to you." But Leo Castelli was as important as Larry Gagosian, and in some ways, mm -hmm. maybe more. He brought about an entire movement. Uh, brilliant, um, eloquent. He could switch from French to, um, you know. French, English, German, all these languages like that. Um, what was it like when you were photographing Leo? 
you know, I, I was there a really short time. I do remember that. I went down to his gallery on uh, West Broadway and it just felt like it. Just very Super. Open. I can't even remember what we spoke about, um, but um, yeah. Lunch so every day, an Italian lunch every day. Took That's the time. Lana, right? Exactly. Yeah. The next, please. All right. Well, it's amazing that you got model releases from everybody. <laughs> Um, which was that's, that's what I think is fascinating that you've organized your archive it's so incredibly well organized and well, that you've kept the, the the release forms for each photo session that you've done I mean it's, it's kind of unheard of but the, the, the fascinating the actual the the release forms themselves become a piece of artwork and that was something that we wanted with right. the Cindy one to incorporate in the book right. they're just beautiful yeah All right the next please Basquiat. Okay. Um, yeah. And many of these pictures, I should say, are in the collections of MoMA, the Whitney. This particular picture is the Houston Museum. Um, they're widely collected. The next, please. Bruno Bischoff Burger. Yeah. Wow, what a man, huh? Yeah. I mean, he, he, I couldn't believe it. He called me up and said, I want to come to your studio. Um, can we set up a time? And I said, yes. <laughs> um, he bought 40 photographs that day and yeah. wanted to buy more, but I didn't have any more. A good so, day. Yeah. And can you talk about the portraits in the back? These are so. Um, I I said Bruno, I really want to photograph your family, and I, I did that twice. Went over to Zurich and did that a couple times. But um, he's standing in front of a war hall of his two children, Magnus and Flora. Um, and kind of remarkable because you're still in touch with his children. All of his children, I'm in touch with. Yeah. Okay. The and next next yeah, place. Yeah, Okay, we talked about this one, and that's the book which he did on the right. Um, really an amazing book. Next, please. Now very collectible. Moria Breyer. Um, it's interesting because, you know, you uh, pull out something so amazing, like people entrust their inner thoughts with you. Could you talk about this with Moira for just a minute? Yeah, this was her Vanity Fair, um, and I was assigned a uh, you know, I went, actually, the way you used to work with magazines, you'd go meet the editor um, at Condé Nast, and they would tell you what they wanted. And then you would go maybe meet the artist and bring back some Polaroids of what they look like, and what you had in mind. And I did that, and then um, I went back. But you know, Laura, I didn't know, um, had cancer. And um, this is a wig she was wearing. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, she's looking back. It's it has a different meaning now that I know. But she was she was sick. And it's very beautiful, also, with the context of uh, what I do with my gallery because I've collected, as you know, we collect um, her work and shown her. And I did an interview in 2013 for a show called Four Women and a Kusuth. The Kusuth said, uh, "What does this mean? 84 inches wide and yellow neon, about why women artists are undervalued, which I think is still a big topic, although we're." working at it now. Um, and Ross Blechner said she was the Catherine Hepburn of the art world. Love she was windswept, she was brave, she was bold. I mean, it was like uh, such a great quote. Um, the next please. Peter, Peter Halley. Halley. Yeah. It's interesting because you've got um, these conduits and the shadows on the left, which sort of echo a little bit what happens in his paintings. Well, I mean, I was in a studio. I, I don't remember there being any natural light. It may have been at night or late, but I, I had to light this pretty heavily. And um, so I just went with the shadows. Next, please. Robert Maplethorpe. I'm going to move a little bit so we can get into the contact. Yeah. Next. Here OK, so here we go. Um, Halloween day, 1985. Tell us about that day, please. Um, Gosh, um, I don't remember, you know, the crazy thing, I don't remember a lot of details of that, except arriving at Cindy's studio, I took a taxi down with all my stuff. Um, she answered the door and I went in, I saw this ping pong table and all the props. And I thought, you know, I don't really want to um, photograph with a lot of information around. Um, and I, I kind of just, this was this was the one picture I selected because it was very minimal, and now I like the other versions of uh, you know with stuff around. Um, 
can see it. But we're going to get to those variations in a minute. I'd like to read um, a post that, um, or a quote from Jerry Sauls on Instagram, where he said, a visionary photographer photographing a visionary photographer, both at the dawns of that vision. And I really love that quote. Oh, I, I do too. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I like that. We'll be getting a little more into this, but you were much more shy in 1985 than you are now. Yeah. Um, I remember first off, it wasn't like when you, you know, carry this and this is your camera. A Hasselblad is quite a heavy camera. And you brought a, tri a tripod, you brought lights. Yep. It was really almost like, you know, you could have used a Sherpa or an assistant, but you like to be alone, is that well, right? Yeah, for me, the whole idea of taking the portrait is, is the dialogue between me and the sitter. And if you've got somebody else in the room, that changes everything for me. And um, for Cindy Sherman. So in a funny way, we're dealing with two shy photographers who like to hide behind the camera. I find that a really interesting dynamic. Yeah, I mean, so that, I mean, I don't remember really what we talked about that day at all. But the irony is so profound. I mean, Nick, this must have struck you right away. It's all oh, day. Oh, so props. This, this was the image that I connected directly with Jeanette over. So what appealed to me about this was that, you know, she's, she's not kind of observed in this way. She's completely stripped back and raw, kind of just freshly washed hair. And it was that gaze that was kind of captured. It kind of cut through all the props and there was no kind of fanfare or distraction. That's what I uh, was particularly attracted to. And also I think from a publisher's perspective, I think it's these kind of in-between shots that are the most interesting to me. And that's why I kind of reached out to Jeanette. And, and I emailed Jeanette expecting that there would be kind of five, 10 at best images. And you got back to me straight away and you said, well, I do actually have quite a few. And you sent through the four contact sheets. And again, the, 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 the variation of images on the one subject, it, it's, it was so completely fascinating to me. Maria, let's see the next, please. Thank you. So here's one of the contact sheets. And this is really incredible. Mm -hmm. um, Jeanette, there's this thing where you are such a reduct, you know, reductive, yeah. minimalist. Um, I mean, I've experienced this within our home. If I'm, you know, um, is set something aside that I'm thinking of getting rid of all of a sudden, it's, it's at the recycling center. And it's <laughs> like, I'll say, like, you know, where is that? It's like, well, you can go to the recycling center and get it back if you want. Um, there's that element in this where, let's see the next slide. Um, so, you know, I mean, what a wonderful picture here. Um, it's different than the one that you had made public, but do you both like this image, right? Nick, you like this one? But, but also what kind of appealed to me about this collection again, if, if you look at the, the, the photograph of her face, it's not actually pin sharp. And, you know, both Jeanette and myself talked about this, that we could, look at this portfolio and you know we we could go through it and correct individual images that are going to be featured in the book but we kind of liked those imperfections and to me that that created an, an arc throughout the book that the imperfections really kind of tell the story of the day and i wanted to kind of leave them as they originally were so that they reflected the contact sheets from 1985 that was really important to me and you know, we, so brilliant such yeah. an amazing decision and i came across because, because I, I sorry I, I think that most publishers would want perfection they would want it to be completely tweaked corrected color balanced so everything looks uniform and you know we 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 talked about this in detail saying that the imperfections are really going to tell the story of the day and there are some images that are kind of more kind of flooded with with kind of the darks and the the, the kind of blacks. Um, but but Jeanette, you were saying that that was because the sun was kind of moving around the studio and, and well, the light was changing. Yeah, or, or I was changing the exposure because, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it wasn't digital. And I was really, I was bracketing a little bit just to make sure that I got the exposure right. 
And, and, and some of them almost created like a, a, a shadow in camera and the, there was a real kind of beauty in that. So we left all of those kind of imperfections in the book true to the contact sheets. Um, that was really important, yeah. It's a major point, a really brilliant treatment. And I do agree with you that most publishers would say, you know, let's sharpen it, lighten it or whatever. I, I came across a quote of Cindy Sherman I thought I'd share with both of you because it's a similarity in approach. So what she's saying is, um, in the past I would shoot say two rolls of film and then I take all my makeup off, get out of character, bring it to the lab and then wait a couple of hours for it to be developed. If something went wrong, the image was out of focus or the lighting was off, I'd have to start all over. And then she's talking about working digitally, she says, I can start really without any idea in mind and just be fooling around in front of the camera, take a few shots and look at them on my computer and say, well, that's a good direction to go in. Let's work with that kind of character. Mm -hmm. So Nick, as I say, I'm such a huge fan of this decision. Mm -hmm. See, you kept it true to this moment, 1985. Because, and, because I think that the reject or what would be perceived as rejected images are the most interesting to me. It's it's kind of the flaws, the imperfections, um, also also the kind of confidence to look at a portfolio of work like this and to publish it all. Because Jeanette, it's almost like wearing your heart on your sleeve, isn't it? That that you know, I mean, that to me there isn't a bad photograph in here. But it's yeah. I love the variation, the dark and the light, and. Um, the fact that it has a confidence behind it as a collection. And again, that it has an arc and it tells the story of um, uh, Halloween, 1985. I, I, it all kind of came together and made sense. Um, it's and also, also the, the grouping of the images as well, that we kind of selected uh, panels of four and uh, that, that were, were very, very similar but they had such a slight variation. And, and, and if you look closely, um, the expression does change. And she's very aware of her kind of poise and expression without any props, without any of the, the, the kind of fanfare. Maria, can you go on yeah. to the next? Yeah. So here's another, I mean, right. um, it's intriguing because obviously the classic, the iconic picture that you chose is amazing, but these are also, they have so much. Well, you know, that's another thing. Yeah, you know, my eye has changed in, in mm -hmm. or, you know, throughout these years, um, totally. Um, so um, I would, if I had taken this today, I would have selected it. Yeah. Um, Nick, I was saying to Jeanette the other day, it's almost like a producer going back and taking mm -hmm. a classic album like the Allman Brothers Live at the Fillmore, and okay. then, finding a different version of Whip and Post or One Way Out, so that those like me who know the other one note by note have heard it 10 million times. We're seeing a variation, we're seeing a richness. Mm -hmm. Maria, can you see the next? And it's adding, oh, now we're into Cindy Sherman. I thought I would kind of build up where Cindy Sherman was. So this, of course, is from the untitled film stills, 77, 78. Next, please. And then in 81, 82, she did these epic pictures of herself. Um, the next, please. And now we're into 85. So this is the moment this, of the picture. I saw this show at Metro. Right, which just closed yeah. on Saturday, yesterday. Yeah. The next, please. And I thought I would read one quote from Cindy Sherman, um, which is really interesting. So um, she said, um, people think, oh, it's just so torturous. And I thought, wow, that's not true. I'm having fun when I'm working, even when I'm doing really dark subjects. So 85 is when she started doing dark yeah. subjects. Yeah. She put everybody on their heels. They're like, oh my God, what's she doing? Um, and I think that's really interesting. She put in fake teeth and all this heavy makeup. Um, the next please. So, and look at what you got. It's like she's stripped bare. It's Cindy without, any embellishment. Yeah. But this is this is what I mean. It's almost like the pendulum swings completely the opposite way, and you see her completely stripped back. And again, the variation in terms of exposure when you see them as a panel of four together, I think it, it creates a kind of different beauty. Um, and again, if, if if you look at them, some of them the the top right is slightly defocused. 
Um, and again, the image that appears underneath is, is kind of more pin sharp, but I love that variation. I love the composition, the way that the figure sits within the frame as well. But then when you, you, you bring four together, it's, it, it's so powerful. There's one more thing I thought I'd read from Cindy, which is I think kind of an interesting relation to you with your work. She said, people think I'm trying to reveal these secret fantasies or something. It's really a, about obliterating myself within these characters. Yeah. I mean, you have a stance when you're taking a portrait where you become almost invisible. Could you talk I, uh, about the cafeteria uh, when you were a child? Yeah, I mean, well, uh, I can talk about that. Well, yeah, when I was, I don't know how old I was, six or seven or eight, I was, um, I would take pictures with my eyes, just blinking my eyes. And I remember sitting in the school cafeteria thinking, I'm doing a little slideshow with my eyes because I'm gonna see this when I go to heaven. I don't know what that was all about, but you know, I didn't. I really don't, didn't even like the school cafeteria, but yeah, I guess I wanted to remember it. But um, yeah. Maria, could we see the next, please? So here we are in the book. Um, Nick, I mean, congratulations! This book has already won one award for the design. Uh, can you remind everybody where, what that award was? Was it Wall Street Journal? Wall Street uh, Journal. Yeah, yeah. It's it. It was. I mean. Going, going back to the original idea, I think that, Jeanette, we, we talked at length about how to kind of uh, present these images so that they wouldn't be um, in any way um, interrupted by a, a, a design. So it was, it was to strip everything right back and present it in its simplest form. And we, we looked at kind of lots of different color swatches and uh, fabrications and typeface. The, the, the typeface is actually a 1980s uh, typeface as well. Um, it, we, we, we were kind of looking at lots of different references and, and pulling kind of color sources. This is a blood orange uh, canvas uh, with a almost like cobalt blue. Um, yeah, I, I, I sent through all the samples. So we were, we were working remotely throughout the pandemic and I would send swatches through and, and, and the kind of inspirations were drawn from Sotsas and from 1985 and those kind of bold dynamic uh, colors, um, but that would really complement black and white uh, photography. But the, but the interior of the book is is very very simple, very stripped back, um, very minimalistic. And I mean, I I think that's how your work is, Jeanette. It's it's very kind of uh, stripped back and 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 kind of almost has a rawness to it. That's that's how we we kind of collaborated and worked on the interior of the book. So just to, to underscore a point here, the two of you had not met. This was all yeah. done uh, virtually. It was done with FedEx and with, you know, digital well, files. A lot of Zoom. We just met two weeks ago. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Maria, the next, please. So we're going to go through another angle of the book. Mm -hmm. The next, please. Um, so so the, the, the whole idea is that, the, that these images, the, the the 40 images were contained with inside this kind of beautiful box. And it was this cobalt blue um, frame that you, that you pull and open um, the book and you lift it out. And again, that the images just appear in a chronological order. Each contact sheet dictates the next uh, nine, uh, 10 images. So it's just a very, very simple straight uh, straightforward layout, but it was the unboxing of it that it became a kind of tangible experience. That it's it's the unveiling of um, the, the the book itself. Again, very very simple um, typeface layout. Next, please, um, Nick. I, I do want to point out on the cover, the photograph is almost like a cutout from a proof sheet, and yeah. it's in um, yeah. almost yeah. like what you used to see almost in. The 1950s in a catalog from the Metropolitan Museum or something. That's right. We have like a DBOS panel uh, that there's a, a tip on insert that goes into the front of the book. So it's, 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 it's beautiful. And then as I was explaining that each contact sheet would dictate uh, the next nine, uh, 10 uh, pages of imagery. And also that we would also have the roll number 
on the left hand page so that would it was almost kind of quite analytical it would it would always refer to the image on the next page but i i really like those details um and that was that was kind of an important element that we talked about Jeanette, keeping the the role numbers there's so, another element um Jeanette is all about economy there were <laughs> four roles right i never took a lot of film um right ever unless it was a commercial you know shoot um but no, I just, I, I felt like I don't want to stay too long. I got it. I can go. And I would like to point out that even with, um, even with this camera, I will sometimes see Jeanette holding it up and looking and it's close and not taking the picture. I find that very interesting. Most people would take it and see if it looks good. I try to possibly zoom in. Yeah, I try to treat digital the same way uh, you know, uh, photographing digitally the same way I, pho I photograph film, right. which is not to take too much because with digital, you can go, you can take 2,000 pictures in, you know, a short amount of time. Then you have to edit them. And that's the, you know, so. And I, and I remember, Jeanette, when I, when I first emailed you and I asked about the collection and you sent through all of the contact sheets and you, and you, you were questioning, you said, do you think there's really enough for a book here? And I was absolutely, absolutely, we must kind of do it. But but to show each individual image and, and the subtle variations, that was that was the kind of arc and the story of this. Yeah. Yeah, let's see the next, please. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's just so dynamic, this one. It's just the gaze, the poise. It's almost that she's kind of transparent. She's not there, but it's it's it says everything about who she was in the studio at that time. Next, please. Okay, so this is, Nick, will you lead us through this, please? This is the actual printing process. So we had to print this book throughout lockdown. So I was only allowed into the printers at certain occasions. And, you know, I, it, it's really important that we approve everything at every stage. But um, yeah, it was, it was, it was kind of a, a, a quite a contained project because there's only 400 of these books so uh, we we printed it quickly and um yeah it was it was a fast turnaround we worked really quickly Jeanette didn't we we did we did and Nick, what so is this fun. we're looking at I call it so these fun. are these are the original print plates so the the way that we did the printing it's a four color black and white process so even though they're black and white they're printed with four colors so each each plate is uh made up of uh, four different plates it was and and this this is uh kind of these are some of the layers uh for the uh printing plates but that, i mean they're, they're kind of quite ghostly these yeah. this, this is what i love these in between images that they they create something else they're magnificent it's almost yes. like in the dark room when you're seeing a, a print develop, you know. Exactly, exactly, yeah. How did you learn uh, all this process, the processes? I've been, I mean, my, my background is that I've, I've been working in uh, for a lot of fashion um, brands for a long time. So I was, pre I was art directing and uh, producing the lookbook. So I was very kind of aware of print and all the processes. I had to do that. So, um, I had the opportunity to kind of make my first book. And yeah, ever, ever, ever since I've, I've been obsessed. I mean, you can ask Jeanette, I'm obsessed with Dita. So well, obviously. And mm -hmm. Nick, when was your first book? How long ago? In 2016, in 2016. So um, yeah. Maria, the next. Um, well, Nick, before we, uh, we should really talk about the limited edition portfolio. Too. Yeah. Nick, would you talk about that a little bit? So we have um, this, this, this kind of alongside of the book, we have a box which is nine archival uh, pigment prints that appear inside and that has a signed title sheet. So these are individual um, 11 by 14 prints. And this is a limited edition box of 20. Um, I think there's an image on the next slide. Yeah. Um, so the, these are um, strictly limited, 20 copies, but they're beautiful, beautiful editions. And this is within a clamshell uh, box. Again, it's made with a blood orange um, 
And yeah. the next oh, we have the um, the cobalt blue um, pull cord that appears on the front. These yeah. these are some of the the, the samples that we uh, were looking at. Do you remember, Jeanette? We were kind of looking at cords and rejecting cords, and yeah. And, and you had the, the blue ribbon that we that you and I selected came from Italy, I believe. Right? Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, we we searched high and low for that in in the middle of lockdown as well. So it was um, it was it was worth the kind of push. So it's this beautiful kind of um, overly um, heavy um, cobalt blue. I mean, it, it it's just a gorgeous, gorgeous fabric, and it, it it's the perfect balance against. It just offsets, it disrupts the 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 orange of the blood orange is just the perfect combination but it took a long time didn't it Jeanette we were we were going uh, kind of backwards and forth yeah, yeah trying to to decide on it so yeah, yeah. then it the became next, very obvious the right? next please okay more of the swatches the next so this is a great moment this was when uh, Jeanette and I were in Rome at our apartment and this was when Jeanette was opening the book for the first time. I'd like to really compliment you, Nick, that you've got this beautiful book and it's gonna be sent you know, in the mail and the cardboard packaging, which contains the book is mm -hmm. so spectacular um, and also that it protects the book so well. Um, I, I think the whole experience of unboxing something, it, it, it's, it's the full kind of journey from the package arriving and, and we, we had the uh, cardboard box engineered and designed, and I mean that that in itself is, is uh, it, it, it becomes as important as the book. I know that that sounds kind of a real paradox, but it, it's true that the the book has to arrive in in absolute pristine condition, and and it, it took a long time to design that as well. So I think again the full arc of everything, the package, the 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 mailing. It, it's about a, a kind of immersive experience. You want the book to be arrive in perfection. So, yeah. Uh, the next, please. There it is. Here's the limited edition. Mm -hmm. So then this this is the portfolio. So this is the the twenty uh, strictly limited edition portfolios. And again, if you notice that the blue. Um, Cobalt cord appears on the exterior, so this aids the kind of lifting of the portfolio. And I think again, you know, we we, we talked about a point of difference and how we could kind of not not disrupt, but kind of you know make make a point of difference from the book. Um, but it, but it's so enjoyable, kind of just lifting the the, the portfolio, and then you have these beautiful um, archival pigment prints inside. It's gorgeous. And how would someone go about ordering either at the book or the portfolio? That the, the books are and the books and the portfolio can be ordered directly through the, the website. So um and we, give us tell us the link please. Sure. So it's uh the, the website is www.njgstudio.com. Perfect. Next please. Um, okay. So these are the individual um, images that appear inside. So it's just it's just a wonderful kind of selection. And here you get to see the diversity of what what actually um, appears in the book. But we we've, we've selected kind of again we've we've kind of curated certain plates which we felt really told the story. The the nine kind of plates that we felt really told the story. And you and you can see that there is a real Kind of diversity within the just the, the one kind of setup. Okay, the next please. So this is some of the ephemera, yeah, um, which Jeanette has saved. Kind of amazing stuff. So that's a, 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 something from uh, Paige Powell, who was my buddy at interview, and she had been to D Dale Chilulis, um studio and mm -hmm. felt that I had to have these gloves. <laughs> And, and on the then right, on the right uh, is from uh, an actress um, named Juliette Berthaud, who sadly is no longer with us, but she was writing about the picture I took. And I think it looks like she didn't like one of them, so. <laughs> <laughs> the next. Wow. This is from Allen Ginsberg. I photographed him. I, the next slide you'll see. Next, um, please. 
Yeah, there I am in Allen Ginsberg's uh, fire escape, photographing him from outside because his apartment was quite small and Alan took this picture of me um, and sent it to me. I love how you open the envelope kind of in the middle. And look, it says, here's some photos from the visit drugstore prints. He, he got everything done at the drugstore. Next, please. Um, on the left is menu from Cafe Luxembourg. Um, Interview Magazine gave me a baby shower um, for our daughter Isabel. And on the right is my favorite room at the Chateau Marmont. I decided I just needed to take the key. <laughs> Number <Next>. 66. <laughs> Next, please. Uh. On the left is a photograph taken by Viva um, of me and her daughter, Gabby Hoffman. Um, and on the right, I think it's just a pass for the Locarno Film Festival. Um, yeah. Which is sort of amazing because then we met on September 10th, uh, 1984, you know, so, so like right after that. one month later. Yeah. And um, next, please. Yeah. Um, just more, you know, Bennett, me and Venice, taken by my, my good friend Matthias Gruner. Um, I think that was the ones on the bottom. I was actually, I think I took them actually waiting for you at the airport right. one time. That's right. And it's interesting because. I remember what you were wearing when you went to City Sherman's. You did. You were wearing a white <laughs> shirt, blue jeans, black belt, big buckle, cowboy boots that were black, nose pickers. And it was, <laughs> you're, it's a way it's a uniform. It's got a lot of style, but it's almost like a type of protection for you. So you can go down and be a little bit anonymous, like drift behind yeah. the camera. I mean, I think a lot of photographers dress so that they don't, attract a lot of attention. You want to you sort of want to be neutral. Um, the next slide. Please. That was interesting to me, Jeanette, that you that when we we first spoke and, and, and you said that you found it kind of quite terrifying putting yourself in these uh, situations that it was, you know, you're, you're in the center of this situation, you're directing it, but yet Were you, you know, to the, really context, uh, the first image. Again? And, you know, one thing I will add is, um, and I've said this many times, I get really nervous still before I take a portrait for days. And then the minute I get into the situation and start photographing, it's fine. But I just work myself up. I, I go That's okay. Just set another one. That's good right there. Conversation in yeah. my head about, um, I'm not going to be able to do this. I'm just, I'm going to mess it up this time. <laughs> it's just every single time. Right. It never ends. And you didn't. Um, I think we can wrap this up. I think we've covered it. I'd like to, uh, first off, thank those who joined us today. Um, and I'd really like to congratulate you, Jeanette, and also Nick. Um, I think it's a remarkable story. Uh, there are great things that happened during the COVID period. I think this is one of them, uh, that a book was created. Would the review have happened if not for COVID? We don't know. They were looking for stories. Nick spotted it. Um, acted right away and the exhibition reacted. did get a lot of press and that was one i mean it was that was a great thing um, and, and also we i mean we, we worked really fast on this as well and 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 the, the the bigger picture is that you know we're we're talking about other projects which you know i had the opportunity two weeks ago to come to the studio which was fantastic and you know so we're in the process of developing a couple of a handful of new projects which is really really exciting so it's, it creates new opportunities you have one starting point and it, it it takes you to a totally new place and that's that's what i love about it so and it's been it's been really good fun i mean we've 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 really oh, kind of enjoyed the whole process so it's so much fun without divulging too much is there any tidbit any tease you could give us about what's going to possibly come next well, we're, we're, as you know, I mean, I, I'm kind of obsessed with Basquiat and uh, Jeanette's kind of archive of Basquiat from coming to the studio and kind of immersing myself in that world for, you know, a good, good full day. I mean, there, there's something really, uh, yeah, exciting on the way with that. And also, also, I mean, Jeanette, do you want to talk about, we, we talked about um, all of the artists that you photographed in the 1980s and how we could kind of maybe 
continue that dialogue through uh, kind of, you know, some of the female artists and um, and you'd, you'd photograph Collier Shaw and, you know, we, yeah, we spoke to the- A new book on new portraits of, of women. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's one of the new projects. Right. Um, right. That's just in, in progress right now. Well, well, I'll look forward to that. So thank you both for joining us here today. And for those who've missed it, we will, or missed a portion of this, it will be posted on the James Barron Art uh, site. We'll get it on YouTube. And um, thank you both once again. Thank you, James. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. Pleasure. Bye, Nick. Bye, Nick. Thank you. Thank you.